As there are no really big tournaments on the horizon, I thought it was time to start a new topic on the Powerplay Chess channel. So I asked some of my patrons for suggestions, and then some of my patrons, my more generous patrons, voted on those topics, which one I should pursue next. And they voted for a selection of Fisher's best games, and I'm really happy to do that. Bobby Fischer, of course, became world champion in 1972. Many people feel that he is the greatest chess player ever to live. He was an extraordinary man, an extraordinary chess player. And, uh, well, I'm really happy to go through some of his games. Some games you might have seen before. I will also pick some games that are less usual over the next few weeks. Perhaps you haven't seen those before. But I make no apology for giving games that you might have seen before and hopefully I can show them in a fresh light. One thing that always strikes me when I play through Fisher's games are their strategic clarity. And this game, I think, demonstrates that quality of his very well. This was played in 1960, so he was still pretty young. He was still a teenager. Played in a tournament in Argentina, in Mar del Plata. And his opponent, well, I think we can see by the standard of this game, really not very good. But in a way, that highlights Fischer's um, style even more, because it shows he was able to carry out his plans without much uh, opposition, actually. But it shows his style very well. So, Fischer playing white against Gadia, who I believe is an Argentinian player. And it's a Nidor variation, so Fischer uh, facing his favourite opening. And he plays bishop c4, which of course was his favourite response to the Nidor for, well, many years actually. And he drops the bishop back to b3 to preempt b5. And here the variation that I like very much is knight d7 to bring the knight c5. As you can see on my uh, DVD on the Nidorf. But the other main move is of course b5. And Fisher castled. And here, well, the main move is bishop e7. And... There is a lot to recommend for keeping this bishop on c8 for the moment to protect the e6 square. You can see the bishop and the knight lined up against e6. But Fischer's opponent played bishop b7, which is, well, generally the square that we would like the bishop to be on in the Nidorf, looking at e4. But this is already quite risky because e6 is more vulnerable. Now, an immediate sacrifice, not very good, but Fischer goes with his strategic plan of playing f5. And his opponent played knight c6. One might also question that move, but anyway, we'll go with it. And then f5. At least one piece has been taken away from attacking the e6 square, but already black's position is quite difficult because he's facing... A well, obviously, at the moment, there's simply a threat to take the pawn. But also, his king is still in the middle, so he still needs to develop. And, and facing these sort of twin threats of perhaps an attack on the king and looking at weakening the light squares is already quite a difficult task for black. In principle, we would like to keep the pawn on e6 to cover the e6 square and keep this bishop blunted but this is tough you know if you play for example queen d7 we trade and now maybe queen d3 and later on a queen here or maybe queen e2 perhaps looking to play e5 or rook d1 it's already quite difficult if b4 then you can just sacrifice here um, I mean, this this would be absolutely disastrous for black. King d7, e5, and so on, and it's dreadful. Or if black declines the sacrifice, 
Then the knight will just wander around here, and once that knight lands, it will be devastating for black. So black takes no chances and closes the position with e5. So we have this very familiar knight of pawn structure, d6 and e5 against e4 and f5. Now, if black is given time, say to get castled and put the queen on b7, then black might be doing pretty well as e4 doesn't have protection from a pawn. But it's all a question of time and black doesn't have a lot of it. White could be very bold here and play bishop g5 straight away. We'll compare this with the game in a second. This involves a pawn sacrifice. Check. And then black can take on e4. I mean, white obviously has superb compensation here. And then, well, we just, just get pieces into play. But Fischer played without complication. He played queen d3, simply defending the pawn on e4. Now, if black tries to exploit um, these, the, the weakness on e4 very quickly like this, and then queen b7, this is just too risky. White starts the process of opening up the queen side. Remember, black's king's still in the middle. And if knight takes, then we can take on b5. Take here and knight d5, and this is just horrible. Knight is attacked as well as knight c7. So black has to play prudently here and play bishop e7. Bishop g5. So this starts a very clear plan of eliminating the knight on f6 and then looking to sink a piece into d5. And by this stage, there's not a lot that black can do about that. So here we go, bishop takes f6. Now, which piece do you put in on d5? Knight d5 would give white some advantage because this bishop is just a wonderful piece. But here, black could fight back, let's say a5. It's not so easy to break through into black's position. You know, this bishop will, will one day come out onto the dark squares potentially, and if black opens the position with b4, still in the game. Bishop d5, I imagine Fischer was playing this instantly, like a blitz game. He must have played this a thousand times before. Very clear plan, just to trade bishops and sink the knight into d5. Here, rook takes c6 is dreadful. Um, I think black should try to fight with queen c6. So white can't play knight d5 immediately because c2 hangs. So white will have to play, for example, rook f2. Um, and, and black can fight a little bit here to try and get some counterplay. Um, but that knight sooner or later is going to find its way to d5 and then black is strategically lost but i think queen c6 still makes a bit of a fight of it but after rook c6 this is terrible so rook d1 now why didn't he play knight d5 straight away because <clears throat> the queen would have come into d4 so that's the point of playing rook d1 first and only now knight d5 because well, queen d4 would, I'm afraid, run into this, and the queen is lost. That's why the rook came to d1. So back we go. So the queen had to come back to d8. So after this, you can see white now has a strategically winning position. This was exactly the position that Fischer was aiming for when he played bishop g5 and knocked out that knight on f6 ages ago. So this is what I was talking about when I mean that Fischer played with great strategic clarity. He knew exactly what he was aiming for, and it's very positional, very strategic chess. And with this good knight against the bad bishop, 
black is utterly lost. That knight is just a beast in the middle of the board, covering all these squares, very important squares as well, and that knight just restricts black's freedom of movement. Bishop dropped back to e7. Well, I think it's probably better to keep that bishop on f6, but to be honest, by this stage, it's very difficult to offer black any sound advice. And here, just stop for a moment. Pause the video if you want to. If you haven't seen this position before, have a think. What would you play with white? And I have a feeling, if you don't know the game, that Fisher's choice will come as a bit of a surprise. I have to say the move that I would play in an instant here, and perhaps many of you, is f6. Just to charge down the king side. And there is nothing wrong with this move. Absolutely nothing wrong. Um, pawn takes, well that would be dreadful, but let's say bishop takes. Here white has a choice. You can play very simply. Just damage the pawns, play queen h3 and look to, to bring the rooks over. And I have no doubt that white is doing extremely well in this position. You could also play rook takes and just rook f1. Also very, very powerful for white. So what did Fisher play? Rook a1. He turned his attention to the other side of the board. This is a fantastic move. And it's, it's an idea that, since I saw this game, I've used on uh, several occasions in my own games with in similar strategic uh, positions, strategic patterns. So the idea is simply a4 is happening. Normally, if there's not a knight on d5, then black will be able to counter with some kind of b4 at some stage. But with the knight on d5, it's simply impossible. Black has zero counterplay. So, for example, let's say bishop f8 to bring the bishop out of harm's way. a4, if this is captured here, then white is just going to double on the a-file. And this looks absolutely terrible. The pawn will soon be lost. Or rook b8. Let's trade. And now you could play rook a7. You could also play b4 and rook a5. Um, you could also play, in this position, you can actually win material. This knight hits the rook, hits the pawn. The rook goes back, then knight a6. I mean, this is it's just terrible. So after a4, black is just losing material, losing a pawn on the queen side. And it's really, you can see the power of that knight, because it, it really dominates black's uh, major pieces. In the game, black played f6. Well, this move just looks appalling um, to weaken the king in this way, not just on this, along this diagonal, but along the seventh rank. Um, in the long term, looks terrible. In the short term, also not very good. After a4... Fisher's carrying out the same plan, but after rook b8, now there is a loose rook. Knight takes bishop, and here black resigned because, of course, queen takes queen check. Told you that diagonal was fatally weak, and white wins a rook. Um, I love that game. It's so simple, but gives such a clear demonstration of Fisher's very clear strategic style, and... In clips over the next few weeks, I'll be hopefully demonstrating that in some further games as well.